Here we are uh, with my old friend, colleague, and all of famer Steve Flink, uh, while uh, Indian Wells is just uh, over and uh, Miami is just starting. How are you, Steve? I'm well, you bother. It's nice to be back with you again. That was good tournament, and hopefully we'll have an even better one in Miami. Yes, I do hope we will have uh, a better one, because to be honest, uh, uh, even if... Uh, uh, the the final this year was for one set at least more entertaining than last year. Uh, the whole tournament didn't excite me too much. Which are the matches that you found more interesting to to watch and to follow? Uh, it, well, uh, there were there were a couple of Medved. There were Medved had some very interesting matches. He got in a lot of trouble in the semifinal against Tommy Paul. He lost the first set. 6-1, never held his serve in the first set. And then he was up 4-11 in the second, but had to win it in a tie break and finally ran away with the third 6-2. It was interesting because Tommy Paul played in a way that we haven't seen him do before. Too, and he attacked more than we've ever seen him. He served in volley a lot. He went to the net very frequently and gave Medvedev a lot of problems, but Medvedev solved them in the end. That was a good match. Medvedev hold Garuna for two sets, was very tight, well played. Medvedev and Korda, I enjoyed as well, was a three-setter that Medvedev squeaked out after they had 15 service breaks across three sets. So those matches, plus you bother, the one that I really enjoy, Taylor Fritz had Holger Runa by a set and five, four match point and went down in three sets. And, and that was like two different matches wrapped into one because Fritz was dominant for a set and a half and he couldn't just have the upper hand dictating the rallies. And then Runa suddenly uh, lifted his game so tremendously after that he he was in the zone from the end of the second set through the third set and uh, I enjoyed that one so these were very good matches we just didn't have any of those matches that we that we're going to be thinking about at the end of the year you know what I mean six months from now we won't look back on Indian Wells and and, and think of that many matches that we found compelling yeah yeah there, uh, when we saw maybe Sinner and uh... Alcaraz, we saw some uh, extraordinary rallies. I mean, not the whole match, unfortunately, because the third match, uh, uh, Sine was uh, unable to play at his best. I, I have the feeling that he was uh, really uh, somehow injured, even if he never said that, uh, uh, because he, he has a lot of fair play. He's a good friend of Alcaraz. Uh, he didn't find any excuses, but I mean, to see him uh, wasting 27 uh, unforced foreign, it's something that uh, uh, I don't believe uh, it could be true if he was fit, 100%. I agree. I agree 100%. Listen, we, we saw they had the long rain delay at 2-1 in the first set, and then Sinner ran away with that first set, 6-1, and played quite well. But Alcaraz was missing a ton off the ground, making a lot of unforced errors. So the, the level overall... From Sinner was very good, from Alcaraz not good at all. Then the second set, I thought they both played pretty well. One break for Alcaraz. Sinner had two opportunities to break back. At, when Alcaraz was serving at 4-2 and 5-3, Sinner had break points. And on one of them, Sinner missed a back end down the line that he should make. And on the other, Alcaraz hit a back end winner down the line himself that was spectacular. So Alcaraz won that set, but it was well played. Then I thought the third was disappointing because yeah. I think Sinner, after he fell and landed on his wrist that he was not right. He may, The errors that you mentioned, there were a lot of shanks, a lot of mishits, bad mistakes off his forehand side. So he, as they say, he didn't keep up his end of the bargain while Alcaraz kept playing well. We should have had, in ordinary circumstances, if these guys are both feeling well and at, at the, in peak form, we would have had a great third set. Instead, we had a lopsided third set for Alcaraz. So to me, the match did not live up to expectations. Yeah, yeah, uh, I do completely agree. I uh, I just mentioned that there were some rallies that maybe they could be called uh, the shots of the year. Uh, when, yeah. for instance, you see that one with uh, a lot of uh, uh, well, Sinner had just lost his serve, and that was the first point of the, of the game after he had lost his serve, and they played. Uh, two or three uh, drop shots, uh, yeah. one against the other, and uh, they were in unbelievable in terms of technique. I mean, really fantastic. And also, oh, they were. 
and also the way they they re reacted to that because sinner was la like laughing or smiling uh, uh, like if he had already forgotten he had lost his serve the previous game and alcaraz also turned his head uh, towards sinner making a gesture like saying uh, unbelievable something like that so it was 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 really nice and it was nice also to see these two great uh, competitors uh, to be so friendly with each other, you know, when they were both uh, going out of court or coming back after the rain uh, uh, interruption. And then uh, even if there was a difference when they were sitting next to the ball girls, uh, Sinner was holding the umbrella, you know, like a, a, a real Italian gentleman, if I may say so. <laughs> he was, he was. No, you're right. Everything I, I am in accord with you about everything you said. There's a great mutual respect between these two guys. So Alcaraz has talked about the fact that he expects Sinner to be his his great rival over the long term of his career, and 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 Sinner seems to feel the same way. So they they treat each other with an unusual unusual respect uh, and even warmth, even warmth. And that you're right does not happen that often. And it's understandable why it doesn't happen. So it was very refreshing to see it here. But uh, yeah, you're right. There were some moments like that, highlight reel points, they call them, that they would show on the news that they had 30 seconds to show this match. You'd see, but that, that would be misleading because the overall standard in this match was not up to what we've seen from them in the past. You think about the U.S. Open in 2022 when Sinner had match point against Alcaraz in the four set and also up a break in the fifth and lost an epic five setter. Or you think about the great match in Miami last year, the three setter that there's matches that they have played that I think were much more interesting from beginning to end higher, higher level contests. This one didn't quite get there because they were seldom playing well at the same time. I think only in the second set did they both seem to play well at the same time. Yeah. That, that's why I always think that, uh, uh, you should judge uh, uh, and give an opinion about a tennis match if you see it from the beginning to the end. While if you just see the highlights, you may be uh, get you may get confused. You bother. You could not. Oh, it's in tight. Uh, you could not be more right. And you and I know about that because we've sat through some matches together at the U.S. Open at Wimbledon. I I always think of sitting with you during the 2019. Djokovic Federal Wimbledon final at the 13, 12 and the fifth, and we didn't miss a point. We were there from beginning to end, didn't even go to the bathroom. The so only, that's only different. The only difference is that I had everything in five pages while you <laughs> needed uh, 35. But uh, but we it's true that we kept all the points. Yeah, but we but we also didn't we we kept all the points and we didn't we never left our seats. And and that's the way it is for most of the fans. And you're right though, to be more serious. You really do need to see these matches in their entirety. It, you can't do them justice if, you, if you're in and out and watching half the first set and the end of the second and coming back in the middle of the third. It doesn't work. Uh, may, and, I say, uh, may, I say, may I say something that may sound not uh, uh, elegant or politically correct, but to do that, before we go to watch a final, you be, we have to go to the toilet. True, if, true. You know, we want to stay four or five hours. On yeah, no, it's, it's true. You have to do that. It makes me think of the time that I did an interview with Lars Graf. And you you know Lars. And Lars, yeah, sure. Lars had a great career in officiating as an umpire and then and then as a supervisor. But he umpired the 2009 uh, Wimbledon final between Roddick and Federer that went to 16-14 in the fifth for Roger. Right. He told me that he, he had nothing to drink. He wouldn't drink anything at lunch. He ate, I believe, a tuna fish sandwich, nothing to drink because he knew he might be up in the chair a long time. He didn't know just how long it would be. And he <laughs> knew he wouldn't be allowed to leave his chair the way the players can take bathroom breaks. He can't do that. So we, yeah. as, report, we, we as reporters have to approach it the same way. Yeah, well, Lars Graf became, in the meanwhile, the tournament director in Beijing. Are you yes, right? yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, well, there was one episode. I don't know if you remember. I'm sure you could uh, uh, with your uh, great memory. 
in uh, Roland Garros, uh, Gaudenzi was playing uh, versus Ivanisevic on center court, and the referee, the umpire, had to go to the loop. And he dropped, he left uh, the chair umpire. And Gaudenzi was funny enough uh, that the actual uh, uh, chairman of the ATP to uh, climb up the chair, the umpire chair, and say, Gaudenzi, game, set, and match. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that match. I'm mean, gonna have to trust you on that, but it's a great story. I love yeah. the story. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, there was another, well, you know, about, uh, I would like to say something else about uh, uh, Alcaraz and Sinner, since everybody is talking about them as the two, uh, you know, next uh, future champions. Uh, I mean, they are already actual champions, but uh, uh, that they could, uh, in a way, imitate what uh, we saw in the past, in the recent past, uh, uh, happening to Nadal, uh, Federer, Djokovic, and so on. Uh, but I always uh, say, look, uh, as an Italian, I would love to see Sinner involved in uh, who knows how many finals in a slam uh, be, uh, playing uh, versus Alcaraz. But, uh, I think that it's too early. In Italy, in Italy, they are all very excited, of course, because after 47 years, we didn't win anything. Uh, we won uh, the last lamb in men's singles was Panata in 1976 in Paris. Well, I say, look, uh, uh, right now we have Alcaraz who has won uh, one US Open and one Wimbledon. Uh, Senior was won just one Australian Open. We are far, far away from somebody who has won 20 slams like Federer, 22 like uh, Nadal, 24 like uh, uh, Djokovic. Yeah, no, it's a fair point, Yubala, but I would only add this. That if these guys, if Alcaraz and Sinner stay healthy, if they're not injured too often and they can have careers that go into their 30s, which I hope they will, uh, it's too, it's too much to say that they will end up in the 20, 22, 24 range. But I don't think it's wrong to project, in my view, that they both will go to double digits in the majors, very likely go to double digits. And then we'll see how high they can climb, whether they can get to 12 or 14 or 15. That's that's asking a lot. But I expect that they're so good that they will do that. But they they would need to stay very, very fit for a long time. The remarkable thing about Roger, Rafa, and, and Novak is how deep into their 30s they were all able to play. Roger, before he quit a few years ago, Rafa is still not retired, nor is Novak. And what they've been able to do in their 30s is is, is astounding. And uh, I don't I, I don't know. I mean, you know, Djokovic has half of his majors in his 30s, you know, and, and Rafa has eight majors. And I think Roger won, Roger came back and won three or four in his 30s. So it's, it, it, I, I don't know whether we can expect that necessarily from Sinner and Alcaraz, but we can expect some tremendous accomplishments all through their 20s. Well, uh, I, I do agree with you, Steve. Uh, at the same time, I want to remind you uh, one uh, uh, data that uh, we may have uh, forgotten in a way. Uh, Let's think about what happened in 85 when a guy of 75 years, 17 uh, years and 228 weeks won Wimbledon. He won Wimbledon that year. He won it again in 86. Then uh, he, he won it in 89. And between 88 and 80 and 90, there were three finals in Wimbledon played by the same players. One was uh, Becker. And the other one was the uh, Edberg, and yeah. uh, the, the, they were one was uh, at that time uh, on the eighty eight uh, twenty years old. The other one was twenty two because Edberg was born in January sixty six, and so we were thinking, oh, these three, these two guys will go to double digit probably, as you say that Sinner and Alcaraz could go, but then what happened? That in nineteen ninety. Sampras wins uh, US Open. In 92, Agassi wins Wimbledon. And they both start. In 93, uh, Sampras starts winning seven Wimbledon out of eight. Okay? Uh, so what happens? That nobody could uh, 
forecasts predict that uh, after three years of finals between Becker and, and Edberg, there were players who were beating them or, or who were winning slams. And uh, at the end, Becker has won only, I say only, which is a lot, but won only six slams. And Stefan Edberg won also only six slams. Six, right. So right. They, they were far away from the double digit in a way, but it wasn't their fault. It was the, the it was that nobody could you know predict that there were two young guys, Sampras and Agassi, and then also Courier who won four slams to come out of the crew of the group. It, you know, it's all fair. It's fair, it's a fair point. I hear you on that. I respect what you're saying, but I still believe that for a variety of reasons that with the the approach that Sinner and Algaraz are taking, the professionalism. I mean, Boris was a complicated man and he got distracted by too many things. Edberg maybe had some problems with his forehand. There are reasons you can look back and say, that's why they only won six. But with these two guys and the drive and the motivation they have, the talent, I, I, I will be surprised unless they're injury ridden. I do worry a little bit about them both in the injury department, particularly Algaraz who's had a lot of injuries. Most recently was his ankle, which he turned on a, a few weeks before Indian Wells, and he recovered very fast, which was nice. But he's had a whole range of injuries. That's the only thing to me that could change it. Otherwise, I don't think they're going to end up like Becker and Edberg in the, in the six, winning six, or Agassi winning eight. I, I, I really believe, Lendo winning eight. I honestly believe these two guys will get into the double digits. But to get back to your original point, it's one thing to reach double digits, Ubaldo, and get 10, 12, 14, 15. But to get up into that 20 to 24 range, like the three icons we discussed, that is really, that is, all, to me, almost unimaginable. Well, I, I mean, first of all, and I, that gives me the chance to remind to everybody your great book about Pete Sampras, uh, uh, that uh, when Pete Sampras won his 14th slam, we all, almost all of us thought that was probably an unbeatable record. Yeah. And then, and then three players instead uh, uh, surpassed, I mean, overcome that record uh, uh, with, with uh, you know, uh, winning uh, all together. Uh, you know, it's, uh, how many? 24 plus 22 is 40, 40, uh, 46 and 66, if I'm not wrong. Six yes, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I mean, uh, so it's crazy. Day. No, it's crazy. Um, no, I think the only thing to say, Yubalo, that to me was, has it's probably been an incomparable era. I, I don't expect we can ever have an era like that again, where three players all win between 20 and 24 majors, 20, 22, 24, respectively. I, I can't imagine, but, and, and I think it may go down as the greatest era we've we've ever had in tennis. But I do think that Sinner and Alcaraz will carry the sport. And yes, five years from now, they're going to be players, four, maybe three years from now, players challenging them that we don't know much about right now. Having said that, I still think that there's something extraordinary about both of them. I mean, Alcaraz is just a rare, his shot making flair and his instincts and his talent, uh, when he's right, he's scary good. And Sinner is more, isn't as flashy, but he is, he, he's impenetrable. I mean, when he's, when he's right, he makes very few mistakes. You can't break his serve. There's no, there's no holes in his game and he gets the job done so efficiently and he's got great power and control. So I just feel like, the two of them are going to be able to fend off their rivals and get a lot accomplished, but not, I don't, where I share your view is I don't see them going into the twenties. I see them going into the double digit territory. Yeah. You see, between the two, of course, uh, 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 um, Alcaraz seems more natural. Uh, he has more variety. He plays beautifully at the net. He's capable yeah. to do incredible drop shots, you know, in all different situations with the foreign, with the back end. It doesn't uh, really have uh, a difference between one shot, one one side and the other. Uh, oh. While, while uh, uh, Sinner seems to be 
a little bit more uh, limited in a way, but at the same time, uh, everyone who, who I've been talking to tells me that the 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 weight of his ball is uh, unbelievable. I mean, the the is so heavy that yeah. he, to to play against him when he starts rallying and they can hit uh, 20, 25, uh, 20, uh, 30 rallies uh, from both sides, it's really difficult to keep uh, the, the same pace. And uh, yeah, that's, I think why, he... that's why when he played, uh, if, you, if you look his wins, they come out very easily all the time. I mean, the, the, the maybe one set, right? the only one who, who reached uh, the tiebreaker was Shelton. Uh, 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 but uh, then he lost 6 1 in the second set. Uh, uh, so, if I, I have uh, one small doubt about him, while uh, Alcaraz seems uh, to be capable to fight uh, even the, when the match is going very badly, I mean, or is, uh, you know, is, ca is capable to come back and to fight. If you think uh, even the, the, the final in Wimbledon versus Djokovic, I mean, he, he had to. You know, yeah. Well, think about it. Ubaldo, Ubaldo, think about it. It's a good point. Final of Wimbledon, he lost the first set 6-1 to Djokovic. Yeah. And then he came back and won it 6-4 in the fifth. First set against Sinner, and he, he got it, it humiliated almost losing it 6-1. Yeah. So you're you're right about him. He has he he's a very uh he's a very tough competitor. But I also think Sinner, we've seen Sinner Ubaldo like what he did against Djokovic in the Davis Cup was something I don't know if anybody else could have done, including Alcaraz. And that was Novak is serve. I mean, Sinner is serving at four five, love forty in the final set, triple match point down on his serve, and he wins three games in a row and runs out the match seven five in the third. That I've seen him. I think he is also an underrated competitor. Uh, and you're right that maybe he doesn't have as much flair in his game. But as Alcaraz, but he's very disciciplined, and he's not as interested as Alcaraz is in making shots that are going to please the fans. And and uh, you know, Alcaraz puts a lot of stock into giving pleasure to the audience and yeah. to himself by making spectacular shots. Sinner doesn't care as much about that. So it's an interesting contrast, a different approach. Yeah, yeah, Sinner. Sinner, then, uh, you know, if you talk to him, and uh, you may have seen some interviews, he's always very clever, and uh, he always answers with, you know, uh, where, where, for instance, after he lost, he said, uh, uh, I have to learn a lesson. I was too predictable. He knew what I was going to do. I have to change certain uh, things. And, and to be honest, every time he played... Uh, uh, with a player he had lost to in the previous match, then the next time he was playing differently. I mean, he is very much concentrated, and with his team, with the Darren Cahill and Simone Vagnozzi, they are very. Uh, is very disciplined and very uh, careful to all the details. Yes, and yeah. He, he, he works on them, so uh, he's going to progress. I mean, the reason why he, I think. He dropped. He left uh, his previous team with Riccardo Piatti, to who, to him, to whom he was for sure grateful for having been with him for for five, six, uh, seven years. Uh, it was because he thought that he wasn't working enough well to improve, to to study what to do better, and with Kail and and uh, and. Um, Bagnozzi is doing that all the time. And yeah, immediately, yeah. There, there are players, we have been interviewing all the players in the world, more or less, me and you, uh, Steve. And when, uh, uh, sometimes when you ask them questions after the end of a match, they don't give you answers that uh, they let you understand that they really understood why they lost. Yeah. Well, it does. Yeah, Sinner does. You're saying Sinner does. Yeah. yeah, he's very good. You're right. I, I think he's very, very good at, at facing up to what happened, a acknowledge it, and 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 he doesn't get too critical of himself, but he will he will examine it closely and and take responsibility and yeah. and try to learn. Now, interesting, Yubaldo. They're four and four now. These two. 
I mean, I have a feeling when that's eight matches. When they've played 24 matches, I bet you it might be 12-12. Yeah. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I think they're going to go back and forth a lot. Where yeah. there some days where Sinner's discipline and consistency from the baseline and his serve, unstoppable serve when he's serving well. He didn't have a great serving day against Alcaraz, the last, especially the last two sets, but it might have been the injuries. But no, a lot there'll be a lot of matches where he will be ha very hard to break, even for Carlos. And then there'll be other days where Carlos is hitting those uh, unbelievable winners from improbable positions, drop shotting perfectly, coming in and putting away volleys with 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 ease and elegance, where he will win. But I I can't I can't see either one of them dominating the other. Can you? No, oh, no, I don't I don't see either. I mean, uh, and again, but they're they're both clever. Because I mean, uh, when uh, when uh, uh, Alcaraz lost his first set to six one, and uh, there was uh, uh, one Carlos Ferrero in Spanish, I could understand what Ferrero was telling him. He was telling uh, him, "Don't don't be in hurry. You don't need to make the the point immediately. Just uh, stay a little bit, but play point by point, more quietly, and then uh, 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 Alcaraz came uh, stayed a little bit." more back uh, returning the serve of Sinner. And Sinner was unable to, he, he made only one ace in the whole match and uh, he was unable to get some free points from the service. Yeah. And uh, so Alcaraz started to uh, return less aggressively. And then uh, during the rallies, he was becoming more aggressive, but not at the beginning. No, but more clever, aggressive was a clever strategy, you know. Your father, you're right. More aggressive, but he stopped. He 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 did wait for his openings as as Ferrero wanted him to do. So I didn't think he missed very much the last two sets either. Then you watch him at the beginning of the Medvedev match, down yeah. three love. He settled down there too. He got more composed. He he, he experimented with his return of serve positioning there too, and he also started giving the ball a lot more air. He started to try to make uh, Medvedev play balls up above his shoulder. And then when he saw the chance to rip a winner, he did it. And he's he's some of it is great advice from Ferrero. Some of it is he's got very, very good instincts when he's when he's thinking clearly. When things are going his way, he really knows how to pounce on an opponent and, and bury them, bury right. them in and, his and shots. Yeah, when he saw, for instance, uh, Medvedev staying uh, suddenly even more and more back, because Medvedev tried to change his usual yeah. strategy. He was yes. attacking more than usual. He was uh, uh, coming to the net uh, uh, more than usual. He was staying not so far back uh, at the beginning. Then uh, uh, suddenly went a little bit more back and immediately... Uh, Alcaraz decides to serve and volley, you know, to to because yeah, he, no, Alcaraz, so, he sees he sees those things quickly. Nothing gets by him that way. You're right, yeah. and and uh, I did feel, by the way, I don't know if you did, that Medvedev had to win the first set of that final. Alcaraz did not. I would have been pretty confident that Alcaraz, if he lost the tiebreaker, would have still probably won the last two sets. But Medvedev kind of felt a certain pressure to take the lead and win that opening set. But I think Alcaraz is just a very smart match player, Yuval. It doesn't mean he makes every correct choice, but when when things are going wrong, he will listen to Ferrero and he will uh, back off of certain things and change his game. And that was true in Wimbledon too, because Djokovic destroyed him in the first set of the Wimbledon final. And then, and I thought Alcaraz was going for way too many returns in that, forehand returns, trying to, knock the cover off the ball on the returns and missing. Then suddenly he starts getting a lot of returns back in the play. It's windy. Djokovic misses a few. Alcaraz is very flexible. He adjusts well. But frankly, I think Sinner does too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, no, they, they're both, I mean, Sinner and Alcaraz, very clever guys in on court. And uh, they do, uh, on, you know, one thing that... Uh, uh, remind, uh, again, I would like to talk about Becker and Edberg again, which shows my age, uh, and not yours, because you're much oh, younger mine than too. me. Mine too. You're, you're much <laughs> younger sir, than me. But, uh, uh, you know, Becker, 
uh, was saying sometimes uh, that uh, the reason why Edberg uh, uh, had uh, more consistent results compared to him, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, Edberg was number one in the world for 70 weeks or so, 72, I think, uh, Becker only 12, uh, was, is, Becker was saying, because he plays, he, he, he doesn't have many options. He has to play just one way. Uh, serve and volley, play the back end, uh, volley and things like that. Well, yeah. I have a lot of options, uh, uh, Becker was saying, and uh, sometimes I, I choose the wrong one. Or I, I And uh, I was thinking Alcaraz, in a way, only because he's very young, uh, sometimes, as you said before, he would like to hit a, a winner when maybe he doesn't need it or... Uh, play a drop shot uh, one after the other when maybe it's not necessary. But uh, so it's a little bit more similar in a way to Becker, but with much more consistency. And uh, so he has more chances to, as you say, to go to a double digit slam. And, you but, bother. Uh, you bother. Yeah. You remember when Betty Stova was coaching Hannah Manlikova? <laughs> the women's tour, Betty Stova, uh, the yeah, Dutch yeah. woman. She, she and you remember uh, Hannah had so many shots, so much variety, such an assortment of shots. And yeah. Betty Stovey used to say that Hannah was like Baskin Robbins ice cream, twenty eight different flavors. She <laughs> said that Hannah had twenty eight different choices of what shot she wanted. In a way, Carlos is like that, and yeah. he has to make sure not to go to the wrong shot or not to go to the shot that is non-percentage when he doesn't need to. And it doesn't mean he has to give up all that flair, but he has to be good, wise in his shot selection. But I don't worry about him at all. I think in the long term, he will, he will, he will, he will have no problems. Yeah, well, Anna Madlikova had a great talent, but she was also a little bit uh, fragile, no? Oh, um, yes. Oh, she was. I just mean she had the variety and she also had to make sure that she did she made the right choices on the court. And right. that's, that's true of while, Carlos. While, my, my, while maybe your great friend, Chris Evert, was always having the right choice. I mean, yes. uh, she, uh, she, she, she was less talented than Martina Navratilova, but she knew all the time what to do, in my opinion. Absolutely correct. Hmm. Anyway, uh, one thing I would like to ask you about Medvedev. Uh, one, a few years ago, I thought he was going to be almost unbeatable, especially on our, on our court and indoor. Now I see a uh, few more limits of his game. I don't know. They, they start, uh, players are starting to, to, to learn how to play against him. Of course, he gets to the final. So, I mean, you cannot say that he, he didn't have a, a great... Uh, uh, attitude or results. I mean, we he was a bit lucky, I think, with Paul, eh? with Tommy Paul, because when Tommy Paul was up one set and three two with one mini break ahead in the tiebreaker, then he had the, that problem with the, with the ankle. Yeah, and right. He, he probably I... lost the match because of that. I think I have the feeling. I thought he was going to win, probably. Cannot be sure, but I yeah, I still think Medvedev would have won, but I, I know others who agree with you. We'll never know because that was a tough moment for Tommy to turn his ankle. And he wasn't completely hobbled, but you don't you can't get it out of your mind. He missed a forehand volley after they changed ends of the court, I think at three all, but he, he missed the forehand volley and you had the feeling he was still thinking about the ankle a little bit. You're right. That Medvedev had some good fortune there. But to get to your point, Ubaldo, I felt like you did. Um, but here's here's how I look at it. Medvedev wins the 2021 U.S. Open. He's, he takes he denies Novak Djokovic the Grand Slam by beating Novak in the finals of that Open. Goes to Australia at the start of 22. Has Rafa Nadal down two sets to love in the final, 3-2, love 40 to get the break and maybe run out the match. And Rafa holds on, and eventually Rafa won 7-5 in the fifth. Thought that was a devastating defeat, but Joe, but Medvedev is very good at leaving those disappointments behind him and getting on with it. But now look what happens. You know, okay, then he he at the start of this year he's got Sinner down two sets and the and the he's lost some heartbreakers. Two sets to love against Sinner in the Australian final. Sinner comes back and beats him. He's got he tries so hard to change his game if he has to. Like you mentioned against Carlos, 
Man, but he was trying to hit the ball harder. He was trying to come into the net a lot more. He tried to go away from his normal style, which he tried to do against Sinner in Australia as well, and adapt to the opponent. And it, sometimes it almost works, but it doesn't quite get him there. He's now only beaten Alcaraz once in the last two years. He's lost, after winning the first six against Sinner, he's lost the last four against Sinner. He, uh, Djokovic is, uh, has won two of their three Grand Slam finals and has the big edge in their career series. So you just wonder, are, are there limitations? Will he even ever get that second major? I think he's so good that he will win one or two more. But think how much better Alcaraz and Sinner are going to get in the next two, three years. And now Medvedev is 28, trying to fend them off. It's not going to be easy, right? What do you think about his future? Do no, you no, think he I can do, win? I do agree. That, 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 that I do agree. That's why I I did ask you what you were thinking because I saw I have the feeling that he is uh, uh, not uh, on a how could I say on a climbing position. I mean, is uh, I think is a little bit declining. Or okay, the or the others seem to be better, but uh, then uh, again. Uh, you you cannot count him out for sure. Right? No, you're right because he's always in the thick of things and he's getting. But all, the other thing that I worry about with him, Yuval, though, is he went on that great run the first half of last year and he had five titles. Yeah, by Rome. That's a lot of tournaments to win by Rome. He was doing a wonderful job of taking winning finals. Since then, he doesn't win any finals. Lost to Djokovic in the U.S. Open final. He lost two finals to Sinner last right. fall. He lost to. He lost a center in the Australian final this year, and now Alcaraz gets him at Indian Wells. I think that has to be discouraging, too, when he's losing so many, not only major finals, but finals, period. Yeah, then he has uh, an incredible uh, record to have won uh, uh, all different tournaments only once. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean every right. time he, he, he seems unable to win twice the same tournament, which is something very unusual. If you think there were players who, uh, on the contrary, were winning or playing very well always the same tournament. I remember uh, Tarokshi, the Hungarian in Ilversum, which was a minor tournament. I think he won it five times. Or there were, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's yeah, but you found the other thing. The other thing about Medvedev that I worry about, too, is just he's had six major finals now, six Grand Slam finals. He's, he's won one. He's lost yeah. two to Nadal, two to Djokovic, one to Sinner. So it just seems like the very best players are beating him most of the time. And I think that has to be discouraging. He's, he, he tries different tactics. He experiments with his game. He gives he competes very well, but he's come up short on the big occasions. Yeah, and and, uh, and then uh, uh, one thing is coherent is that he always fights with the crowd. I mean, he always finds a way yeah. to 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 be critics and uh, st and uh, I, I I tell you, I like him. I like Medvedev because he's very clever. He has sense of humor. When you talk to him, he always says uh, in intelligent, clever things, but. Uh, apparently on court, he, 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 sometimes he loses his head. Uh, because yeah, it happened he, again. It, it happened again near the end of the match, with Carlos. Yeah. Yesterday, he yeah. got into it with the crowd, and you're right. He he's trying to stop that, and he's trying to stop yelling at his coach so much too. He, yeah. He's trying to cut back, but he, sometimes he can't help himself. He's just yeah. that's how he is. I'm, he's a little irrational on the court. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, but, um, one thing uh, I would like to ask also, since you must be an expert uh, for sure of the American tennis, there are four players that is difficult to understand who is the best one. Uh, if you talk about Fritz, Paul, Chiafo, Shelton, I mean, we may think the Shelton, I may think the Shelton as the, as maybe uh, he's the best prospect, but just because he's younger, he's less, he's more ex experienced than the other. But I don't know at the end uh, where he can go. Uh, and uh, and what about the other three? Because Paul, uh, I think at the beginning of their career, I think he won the junior Roland Garros. Yeah, he was, he was considered better than Fritz. Then 
he had a lot of physical problems and things like that. So what what is your opinion about these four Americans? Well, first of all, I think I'm a little more optimistic than you are, Ubaldo, about Shelton in the long run. I mean, we saw him get to last year so young and so unpolished, you might say. He has played so little at that level. He hadn't even been out of the country before he went to Australia last year and got to the quarters. And then end of the, after a big slump in the middle of the season, made the semis the Australia, uh, the, the U.S. Open. Semis U.S. Open lost to Djokovic, had a win over Sinner in the fall. Uh, and he's playing okay now. I feel like he, he can get so much better than he is right now. Left-hander with that big serve. Uh, and his ground game needs to improve, but he's, he's a fierce competitor. So I think in a couple of years, we're going to see him, maybe even by next year, threatening in the majors. You know, the I think he's going to get a lot better. The others, they're, they're terrific players. I think Fritz is about as, as – and I've seen some good signs. Fritz looked to me in Australia this year. Maybe that's some of the best tennis I've seen him play when he lost to Djokovic. Uh, he looks fitter. Uh, he, he's, he's got a great serve I, I, and, a, and a good temperament. But he'll lose matches like he did to Runa this week that you think he has within his grasp. He had a match point and he lost. Then you take Paul. And I had begun to think, you bother that Tommy Paul was maybe the best we'd seen from him was last year. But this way that he played against Medvedev and he's won a tournament this year. He's off to a good start, except for a loss to Keksmanovic in Australia, which was surprising. Tommy Paul, I think now can improve because he suddenly discovered that he likes to volley. He never liked to come in that much before. Now he's really committed to it. And he's looking at films of Edberg and Becker and Sampras and others to improve his volley. And I, I, I'm beginning to think he could make something of a leap, but I still say of the group and Tiafo, I'm worried about. He's had a bad start to the year. He may come out of this, but he's a very emotional player. You know, he's had too many ups and downs. I don't think he's going to be as consistent as, as the other. I, I think the other three will surpass him. And we might have seen the best of Tiafo now. You know, it could be that his best is a year or two behind him. But I'm very optimistic about Shelton. Now, now quite optimistic about Tommy Paul. And I think Taylor Fritz can stay where he is. He can stay somewhere between nine and 12 in the world for a long time. Whether he can make a move to the top five, I doubt it. I think Shelton can, and perhaps Tommy Paul could push past Fritz as well. Listen, uh, Steve, as usual, I don't realize how long we talk when we are talking because uh, I could go on forever. And uh, we were supposed to talk about Indian Wales uh, and Miami, and we have been uh, talking for about, uh, I don't know, more than three, within 45 minutes about just uh, uh, Indian Wales and I mean, all, all general subjects. So I wonder if we should uh, stop this uh, now here and just do a separate thing on, on Indian, uh, on Miami, because uh, uh, so that we can also, since I have also to organize a tra translation of all what we said for the Italian website, uh, if you don't mind, I would say hello to you now, goodbye to you, and then we will uh, record about Miami separately, okay? That's fine. That sounds good, Yubaldo. Let's do it. So I just say at the moment, uh, thanks a lot to my old friend, colleague, and Hall of Famer, Steve Flink, and uh, talk to you again very, very soon.